Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We can take our seats for the next speaker. Um, it's Dr. Antonio Rodriguez. He graduated from VIRTS. He entered private practice specializing in assisted reproduction and minimally invasive surgery. He co-developed MedFem Clinic in 1991 and is a director of MedFem Fertility Clinic. He, uh, he has an MBA from Henley in London and co-authored a book, Faster, Better, Sicker, Time Agency, Ref Pre sorry, Time Agency, Perfectionism, Stress. Um, he also developed stami Staminogro, a natural product for fertility and general health and he has a uh, special interest in time agency, uh, perfectionism stress, and its influence on fertility. Dr. Uh, Rodriguez, please take the stage. Right, so today I have been tasked with talking about recent advances in fertility treatment or fertility medicine. Um, what is interesting, I've been doing this for a long time, as you gathered from the, uh, the, when, we, when we actually developed MedFem Clinic. And if I look back about what we started 31 years, 30, nearly 32 years ago, um, and if I say to you, not much has changed, and that's the reality of it. And uh, as, you go, as I go through the talk, you'll realize it. Certain little parts of, of infertility treatment have popped up, of which one of the most important was ICSI, where we could help those men who had very low sperm counts. That was a breakthrough. Pregenetic testing, a big, big breakthrough. And really the rest of it is related to some of the laboratory work that goes on. There's been a recent congress overseas called ESHRI. Um, I think there's 400 uh, talks and if one goes through those talks, which I tend to do, I'm a little crazy about that, you'll find that there's very little new stuff when you go through 400 talks. And the reason for that will be evident as we go through my presentation. So not a, there's never a lot going on, but in terms of patients, they often hear those things that pop up, the new things that come out that are presented by different units, and it sounds very impressive, but over time, when, when we look at it scientifically, and when we begin to look at numbers, they often don't add very much value. And that's what Dr. Clark was alluding to, to a certain extent, saying that we mustn't be geared to add-ons, and your fertility specialist, whatever clinic you go to, that's who you've got to believe in. And the treatments that they offer you are the treatments that work in that clinic. And you've got to believe in them. And that's your journey at the end of the day. What has, the new things that I believe are very important is finally that the world is talking about patient-centered care. Now, this might sound strange. Why, haven't, why hasn't there always been patient-centered care? There's always been patient-centered care, but that, it's becoming formalized. Psychology is a big part of it, and Mandy mentioned that. They're bringing it into the world and saying, we've got to recognize that the patient is important. And these are just factors that we use as a fertility clinic to maximize that patient care. And for me, this is a great advancement. We've got to look after people. And our joy is when that person delivers a healthy, normal baby. That's what we do this for. That's what we've done it for all these years. And no matter what clinic you go to, that's why they're doing this work. I'm not going to go into great detail about this. You heard it in the last talk, and you're going to continue to hear it. Age is the most important factor in terms of what your fertility is like. The other measurements are important that you hear about, AMH, FSH, etc. In terms of unmarried women, it's important not only to check your age, but maybe to have an anti-malarian hormone test to see whether you're going to actually have what we call longevity or length of time to fall pregnant. 
and as I go through the talk, you'll see why this has become important. We as fertility specialists use those other parameters to work out protocols because by the time patients come to us, the AMH is the AMH and we've got to man manage the patient. We can't change the egg reserve. We, we go to that patient and develop protocols for that specific patient. And if you look at those figures, the obvious one is that you've got to be very young to have a very good pregnancy rate and once you get into the 40s, that pregnancy rate is very low. Having said that, we have a large group of women over the age of 38, and with the right kind of attention to detail, they still have babies. So don't write yourself off. Even if you don't have eggs anymore, you can have donor eggs, as Dr. Fenter said. Just again, these little factors, as you get older, your fertility rates go down. So the message actually from us all is that think about your age, think about your fertility. If you want to have a baby, don't wait for tomorrow. Have a baby sooner than later. These are all figures, and if we look at these figures in the world today, I, didn't have, I couldn't find a graph of it, but those are mainly in the late 20s, but that was 2006. Now it's in the mid-30s in all these countries that are listed there. A country like China that has 1.3 billion people are going to run out of people. They are asking people to have their second baby, and they are asking them to have their third baby, but the problem is that they weren't brought up that way. They were brought up to have one baby. So they're going to have a big problem, and we find this in all economies that start to do well, they're going to run out of children. We see it in Europe, and that's why they're happy to take foreigners into their country, to promote people. You need people to look after the next generation. That's not necessarily the case in South Africa. But as individuals, we, every single woman deserves a child. And we'll go through a few things just now about that. We talk about something called aneuploidy, which is just a medical term. It means that the embryo is abnormal. Euploid means it's normal, aneuploid means it's abnormal. As a woman gets older, the, num the eggs that they make become more and more abnormal. And because of that, the pregnancy rate goes down. But what is important for, for anyone that's doing IVF, they've got to realize that the majority of eggs are usually abnormal. So at this moment in time, there are millions and millions of women who are pregnant because they are fertile, but they will not miss their period, and they will not know they're pregnant because that abnormal embryo actually disappears. Until that good embryo is in the female, that good embryo will make a baby. And occasionally, unfortunately, you'll get a miscarriage. And the majority of miscarriages are because nature gets rid of that abnormal baby. And there's a group of people who, unfortunately, the body doesn't recognize that abnormal baby, and you land up um, picking it up at 10 to 11 weeks of pregnancy. What, the other thing that's important, IVF rates are actually static at the moment. So over the last 40 years, we've got to a certain point, and that's where they are. And it's back to why is that the case? Because in order to make a good embryo, you need a normal sperm and a normal egg, and that'll make a euploid or normal, chromosomally normal embryo, and that'll give you a chance of pregnancy. So that's where we are at the moment. And, and as fertility specialists, we're very cognitive of that, very aware of it. And the work is being done, these 400 papers, but there's no magic in all that work that says we can improve someone's egg. The egg is the egg. Again, we at MedFem, and, and I think generally, lifestyle is important. And the emphasis on men is also important. Men need to get their lifestyles right. It's not just a female thing. You can have a good sperm count, and the sperm doesn't behave well because you have a lifestyle problem, because your insulin is raised. Maybe what, your other hormones are out of sync. So, guys, you need to look after yourselves during this process. Time to pregnancy is definitely quicker if you look after yourselves. 
What about costs? Worldwide, these are things that are being spoken about. Back to the patient caring. In the US, the average cost of IVF cycle, so for the same cycle of IVF in South Africa, nothing's different, the drugs are the same, it's $23,000. And if you see the kind of figures there, you're looking at 2.3 to 2.7 cycles, and you're looking at 53 to $65,000. It's impossible, people don't earn that. So that's in the United States, obviously we're in a different place, but it's the same principle. And we need to think of how we're going to manage that for the, for the people that need fertility care. Also, we, we, the, the few things that are very important is twin pregnancies. I don't think triplet pregnancies should really happen. Occasionally, you'll get an embryo that splits. But twins and triplets are a problem. It's a, complica it's a complication. It's not what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve one baby. We'll come back to that just now. So what's happening in terms of world? What is the new stuff? Well, in America, they are making, trying to make it legal in a certain states that the medical funds have to fund IVF. So that's becoming important. And these are points that are important for us as, as medical practitioners and as people. The second one is that, is that fertility is a basic human right and it's a registered problem in terms of the World Health Organization. It's a registered disease. And the last one, we know that certain prominent corporations are actually opting to fund fertility. Some of it, I believe, is a little bit um, uh, selfish. They're kind of saying, well, we'll freeze your eggs and please work for us for longer. I think what they should be saying, have a baby, we'll look after you and your baby, and uh, you carry on working. But anyhow, at least they're doing something. In South Africa, and... and, and uh, if we want to actually get medical aids to change, we need all of you to be the actual pressure group. You've got to be the pressure group. I can't go and pressurize anyone because that looks like I'm looking for work. I'm actually not looking for work. I'm, I like to help people. You've got to help yourselves and get involved in those pressure groups. So a little bit about medical stuff now. They've, they've, showed that there's something in mice called blastoids, and this is relatively new stuff. And these blastoids are the same as blastocysts that you heard of. So day five embryos are called blastocysts. And the reason I bring this up is that the, the inner cell mass, or the actual embryonic part, the, the part of that little embryo that's going to make the baby, determines the future of that baby. And this is very important. So the, babe, the little baby determines the placenta, and then the placenta determines implantation. So we're back to, to the situation of understanding that you need a good egg, a healthy egg, and a healthy embryo, which needs a healthy sperm, by the way. Sperm can also fertilize and be unhealthy and create an abnormal embryo. It's not just the egg. The egg plays a bigger role, but the sperm plays a role. Now, what if we look at here, and you heard it earlier, if we look at implantation rates with normal embryos. So we test the embryo, we know it's chromosomally normal, and we put it back. Only 70% of those will actually turn out to be a pregnancy. So you have to put at least three or four of those tested embryos back before you can start blaming the uterus. And interestingly enough, every time we do a post-IVF failure, because what we do in our practice, we see the patient straight away when we get that negative test. And the immediate effect is that the woman thinks that she's failed. This is not true. It's mostly the embryo. It's very rarely the female. And you've got to put that in your heads, ladies. It's not you generally. And if it is you, your fertility specialist will work out why and how to manage it. Now, what about freezing of eggs? And you've heard a bit about that. The important thing with freezing eggs, and if you look at these graphs, you need a lot of eggs to guarantee a pregnancy. And the older you get, you need more, and obviously the chances of those frozen eggs working are smaller. So if you're going to freeze eggs, freeze them younger, because there's this, tre this trend at the moment that general gynecologists will tell you you've got a good egg reserve, you can wait. Well, if you've got a good egg reserve, 
that's when you should be freezing eggs, not when your eggs are down. Uh, so there's no such thing as waiting. If you think about it, do it. And unfortunately, that's the only way women at the moment can preserve their fertility. In males, if they want to preserve for any reason, this is usually men who have problems. They might have a cancer. They might have um, other problems that needs... It's very simple in a male. He gives, some, he gives a sample, and that sample gets frozen. So what are these new advances that we're looking at? And it, it might sound, why haven't they taken place? These things take long, and they take long in the medical world. But in simple terms, they're trying to optimize the way we, we actually manage patients in terms of their stimulation. What is that stimulation that's specific to that patient? We also want to look at personalized treatment, which we've been doing for years. And this is where, again, when you read on the internet, Google, or you, or you talk to your friend and they say, that's the right thing. It might be the right thing for your friend, but it's not necessarily the right thing for you. So that's very important as patients or potential patients to remember, I want this doctor to tell me about me, not about what happened to my friend or what happened to someone else. There are certain better diagnostic tools that, that pop up, but what happens again, often if they pop up, only with time will we as fertility specialists know whether they work or not. There is patient pressure always to do certain testing. And we find that sometimes that stuff that has come out and looks good and we test it in our particular clinic and other, other clinics do it as well, you find that it's not actually doing anything at the end of the day. Artificial intelligence is starting to be out there where you put data in and you try and actually work out what's best for that person in terms of their profile. And this, there is a future to this, I believe. Given up on me? Sorry, I was just going to go over the back here, but that decided to jump on me. Now, this is an interesting one. And if you look at advances, this is the biggest advance. Single babies is the biggest advance in medicine, in our work. And why do I say that? And it's really very good in Australia and New Zealand compared to anywhere else. The UK is doing okay and America is not doing okay. America does function at a different level. It's very driven by business. They, they've got to put their results in. And they actually have to churn out patients that have low prognosis and they're happy to put back more than one embryo. So it becomes a bit of a, you, everything's out in the world. Everyone knows what your rates are. So you, you want to get pregnancies. But twin pregnancies are high risk. And you know what? Most people say to us they want a twin. The problem with twins is that two things happen. As a mother, no matter what age, but as you get older, there's a high incidence of blood pressure problems that are related to the pregnancy. One placenta has got a chance. You put two placentas in, and the placenta causes the disease in these things of diabetes and hypertension of pregnancy. That rate goes up, and it goes up dramatically. So you're putting the mother at risk. And then in terms of the child, prematurity, growth retardation, early delivery. So those things, when you get a baby that delivers early, they've got to be in an ICU for a long time. And once they're in an ICU for a long time, they could do absolutely fine or they could have long-term problems. Have a baby, freeze your embryos, come back and have another baby. That's the best way of going about this. The cost of freezing your embryos and keeping them there is a lot cheaper than a complicated twin pregnancy. You've heard about pre-genetic testing, and, I, and I'm not going to say a lot about it. It is one of those things that is spoken about a lot. There is a place for it, but as Dr. Clark and Dr. Fenter mentioned, these things need to be planned with that patient. What do they need? What is important to them? Time to pregnancy definitely is quicker with us, and some people want that. They want that time to pregnancy because you're putting a normal, baby, a normal embryo back. So if you've got five embryos and only two are normal, it might take a bit longer to put the right one back. Also, if you get recurrent failures, patients start to get very despondent that it goes back to, there's something wrong with me, there's something wrong with me. If you know the embryos are normal, 
it does change that as well. Very patient driven, you sit with your doctor and make a decision according to that doctor. Just what is this pre-genetic testing, just to give you an idea, what happens on day five, a biopsy is done on the blastocyst. Some of the cells, those are, those are day three embryos on there. So it's a blastocyst. We take some cells from the outside layer, which is the trophoblastic or placental tissue. We take about five to six cells on a biopsy. Those cells are replaced within a few hours. It just redevelops itself. So obviously you need a, a laboratory that has uh, good scientists that know how to do this. And they then prepare it, and then it goes to one of the genetic uh, um, clinics, uh, such as Next Biosciences. They're there, you can talk to them, and they will carry out the testing for us. And we will get a report back of whether it's normal or not, and then in a frozen cycle, we put it back. So just a little bit of principle on that. It's very specific, and it's right for the right person. So what about the future? And there's a lot happening at the moment in terms of genetics and, and what they do with genetics and can we go and predict, uh, can we take away family histories of diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, cancers? They are doing this work. It's a long way off to be routine. And the question is always going to be, is it right? Should we be doing that? Um, is it ethical? And we're not, we, these answers take a long time. The work has been done, and it's been done well in the world, but it's not routine. And a lot of the work that gets put out there is still experimental and will only be done by routine clinics such as us when we know that that is the right way to go. And I'm, the last little slide is an example. If you've got someone in the family with diabetes, they can then we can look at the normality of the embryos, well, in this, in this way of testing, they then score the embryos according to what is the chance of that particular embryo having a diabetes one day or hypertension, and you then got a choice to put one that doesn't have. From my point of view, I think lifestyle plays a critical role in how we get disease and when we get it. So if you control your lifestyle, if you eat properly, if you have the right diet, if you manage your stress, you will you will get those diseases, but you'll get them at age 90, 100, and not at age 40. Lastly, what about the story that we can make sperm and eggs? And the, this is a busy slide. The top part of the slide is just telling you what we do already. We take out eggs, or we create embryos, or we, we freeze eggs. That's already happening. In terms of freezing parts of the ovary, we, that's already been done. But what about taking a, a little skin cell and creating a sperm or creating an egg? That science is happening right now. In mice it works, but it's a long way off. And I'm mentioning this because this stuff is what we read. When you read about Eshri or one of those conferences as people, you think, wow, that's good for me, and it gives you false hope. The reality is if you're yearning about it, it's, ten, it's five to ten years off being routine. But it, this stuff is working. So you take a cell and you change. Uh, our skin cells are, are actually have an ability to become any cell because it's a rapidly dividing cell. And that cell then can go through a process that will make an egg or sperm and that will be used in a way into the, in the future. Exciting, but not here now. Thank you very much. <laughs>